Hello and welcome. In my video last week, I did a overview video of my RV, my 2185 Lance travel trailer, and all of the modifications that I made to it to make it a fully sun-powered travel trailer. And I'll put a card here above so that you can go watch that video if you're interested. In today's video, I'm going to go into the details of the electrical system and more specifically the core components, which is the batteries and the inverters and those components that go along with that. I will be doing some future videos as well when I, I'm going to be going over the solar panels on the roof and how I installed those, as well as other components that I've switched out like the refrigerator and the cooktop and the microwave oven and things like that. So if you're interested in watching those videos, make sure to click on the subscribe button and you'll get notified when I upload those videos. Now, to be clear, I'm not an electrician and I've actually never done a project like this before, like an off-grid solar array. And so I did hundreds of hours of research leading up to this, uh, but I also wanted to have some oversight by an expert to make sure I didn't miss anything. And so I contacted Matt at Continuous Resources, and I'll put a link in the description down below so you can go to that website. And he helped me to design the overarching system and he gave me a schematic that uh, was my guide. I, I departed from that schematic in some places as I wanted to make some modifications like my EV charging circuit on the side of the trailer and things like that. But it was definitely helpful to know and have some oversight of like what gauge of wire would I need from this point to this point, uh, what was his recommendations around what the bus wire should be and things like that. So I highly recommend using um, continuous resources and, and the consultants that they have there to help you with your system and also to purchase components. Now also all of the components in this video are listed in de great detail in a spreadsheet that I made that is linked in the description of this video down below. So if you're interested in that, go then go check out that link. So without further ado, let's get into the details. First off, when you're doing a project like this, normally you would do a audit of the electrical system and how much electricity different devices are pulling and how much overall, you know, how much size of a system you need. In my case, I really didn't do that because I just wanted as much as possible that could fit on this trailer. And my main reason for that is just because I was going to be sending all the excess electricity to the Cybertruck, which is going to be what I'm going to be uh, pulling this trailer with eventually. And when it's parked next to my house, I can be using it to charge my Model S in the meantime and my Cybertruck in the future as well. When I purchased this travel trailer, I intended to use this under couch storage area for this electrical system. And so after getting the trailer, I measured it carefully and did a lot of research on the components. And then I started acquiring those components. And I got some of them from online. I got some of them in brick and mortar stores. Uh, I evaluated the weight of them and where I felt like that would work the best. And this is what I came up with. I also had to consider the weight that I was removing from the trailer. And that was part of the consideration. And so once I had all the components, the major ones anyway, then I started to arrange them in this under couch storage area to figure out where they would fit best. Two battleborne batteries fit lengthwise across this battery compartment quite well but the one problem was there's this wooden strip that just was a little bit in the way so I just decided to bring up the whole floor an inch to get past that bump and then also it would give a false floor to this whole area that I could just screw into and not worry about putting all those holes into the bottom of the trailer floor itself so the girls helped me bring out this styrofoam board that's a half inch thick out to the trailer and then I cut it to dimensions and that brought up the level halfway and then I brought in a half inch plywood piece that then brought it up the rest of the way and that is what I built everything on. I then continued to fit components into where I thought they would fit the best and I also made sure that with the couch on that there was still room enough underneath it for everything to fit. Uh, I put this uh, foam pad on the sides of the batteries to stop vibrations and hold them snugly in place. And then I put straps over them and used these metal brackets that I had laying around to uh, hold them in place so that they won't go anywhere. One of the inverters I was able to fit here on the sidewall, which fit perfectly on that structure. And then I put a little strip beneath it just to help support it and to give additional cooling. And then I fitted the second inverter into the middle area and found that the AC distribution panel fit perfectly right there between them. And then I continued to try to fit the smaller components in various places. I then began the process of charging up each of the batteries individually fully so that they can be then connected to each other and I started to cut the wiring and crimp it and get them connected up to the bus bar. And as I did that, I was careful to make sure that they were all the same length 
And I also weighed the components because initially I thought I was gonna be weighing everything to make sure I knew how much weight went into the trailer. Then I realized that just takes too much time and so I only measured or weighed uh, those particularly heavy things after that. I then connected the DC to DC converter up and was able to wire that into the existing 12 volt wiring of the trailer relatively simply just by having that one component added. The next thing I then added was the Serbo GX and being able to see the readout of the system through the LCD screen. In order to mount this second inverter in the middle of this storage bay, I had to build a wall for it to be able to be attached to since it was on its side. So I built this wall with a lower and upper support, put the bracket on and it slid on perfectly and it has a support underneath it just like the other one does. I then began to wire up the inverters and in all the wiring I used wire ferrules wherever I could and you can see that makes for a really clean connection and so I attached the switches and the wires to the correct locations. Uh, I used the clamp connectors for the AC distribution panel to make sure there's no fraying of the wires. Uh, I had to buy a separate grounding bus bar so that it can uh, ground because it didn't have that already in the uh, AC distribution panel. In order to get the wiring to the existing electrical distribution panel, I needed to drill a hole in the floor and pass the wiring down underneath the trailer outside and then back up underneath the, the kitchen area, the kitchen sink area. So I drilled a two and a quarter inch hole for that. And uh, as you can see, there's a sandwiched layer there of styrofoam with uh, the wood fire and fiberglass on either side of it. And it looks like there's even a metal layer there and I'm not sure what that's doing or if that's everywhere. And then also underneath here is where I was able to send a, a, a wire down to the frame or chassis of the trailer for the grounding of the trailer. And then I drilled another hole that's underneath the kitchen sink for the wires to come back up from underneath. And then those wires route around to the back of that wall and around underneath the microwave to connect to the back side of the existing electrical distribution panel. Once I am for sure done running wires through these holes, I'm going to be sealing them off with this spray foam insulation. After getting the ground wire connected to the chassis, I then installed a grounding bus bar up above so that all of the things that needed to have ground wires connected could be easily connected to that bus bar up above. And then at this point, I also separated out the 12 volt wires and I added a bus bar between so that I could then use that bus bar for 12 volt uh, applications right there under the couch. Also at this time, I added in the DC circuit breaker so that I could turn on or off the 12 volt system from this point. Also, I didn't really like how close the wires were to each other on the DC to DC converter, so I added some extra rubber uh, here just to make sure there's no rubbing in the future that creates holes. Throughout the process of this entire trailer retrofit, uh, the girls wanted to help constantly and there were certainly some parts where I had to just do it on my own. Uh, but wherever possible, I wa wanted them to be able to be involved so that they could have some fun seeing uh, how this technology works. Obviously, they don't necessarily know how it works, but I would explain to them what I could and they had fun helping for sure. And then also these large ferrules for the larger gauge wires did not come with any kind of heat shrink or anything to hold them in place. And so I just put some uh, heat shrink around the end of them and, and that held the ends on just fine until I got them up into and clamped down on, into the device. Now that I had the batteries and inverters wired up and ready to go, I needed to tie them into the existing electrical panel of the RV. And as part of that, I was going to be using a surge suppressor. So I wired that in and mounted it here underneath the microwave. And then I realized it actually would work better if I put it where the converter used to be, and then it will be accessible in the future if I ever need to access it. Now that I had the core components done of the RV, both delivery, the DC and the AC electricity, I expanded out into the EV charging circuit and getting that installed. The battery compartment on the side of the trailer was the best option for doing that. And I was able to run the wire up underneath the drawers and into that battery compartment on the back side. And then I drilled a hole through it and wired up the NEMA 1450 outlet. This is so exciting right now. If you look here, it's only pulling five amps because I'm just doing a test load, but you can see it's showing 240 volts and so one kilowatt. And the exciting part about that is not the charge speed. You can see here it's charging. And where is this cable going, you ask? It is going to the RV. So over here on the side of the RV, it's dark right now, so it's really hard to see, but I'll show you a picture. It's uh, going into a NEMA 1450 outlet that I just barely installed just now. 
and then going around into the RV itself, we can now see the uh, display here from the Victron system. And it's showing that it's inverting and that the AC loads are 1100 watts. Line one, line two, each one supplying just over 500 watts. Battery is currently at 84%. And now I'm just kind of doing a load test to see uh, how it'll do after leaving this on for a little bit. And I'll slowly ramp up the number of amps it's pulling. So I started slow first with just five amps at 240 volts, and then I slowly ramped it up. And I actually had Jessica sit in the Tesla changing the amps, and then I stayed in the RV so I could monitor the systems as she slowly increased the amperage, and we just talked on our cell phones until we got up to the maximum, and then the overload light started to blink, and so we knew that that was the maximum. All right, I'm doing a load test, charging the Tesla, and this is pulling, the Tesla is pulling 21 amps right now. And you can see we are sitting at just shy of 2,500 watts on the first inverter. And when, uh, when I put the Tesla to 22 amps, then the overload light comes on, which is right there. So it looks like that's about the limit. I also tested the electrical system by running a regular old space heater and I also turned on the electric water heater to see how much energy that pulls. And then I was done with testing at that point in time. Because my master inverter is the only one that can charge because my input is a 30 amp RV plug, uh, I had to go into the configuration settings and change the uh, inverters so that they will not switch together or switch as a group as you can see here. And that makes it so that only one will start charging and it will successfully do that. Now I needed to mount the display for the Servo GX up in the normal place where I wanted it to be, which is where the solar charge controller was previously. So I was able to use the exact same space without any modifications, but I needed some backing on it so that the plate that it snaps into uh, could be mounted. So I installed some uh, wood there and then uh, snapped it in and it worked great. However, it doesn't look fantastic, so I asked a friend with a 3D printer if he could print me up a frame, and he did just that, and it looks fantastic. And then I mounted it to the wall with a double-sided Velcro, and it just stays there just fine. The last thing I did was to cap the propane line that was here previously for the stove and the oven, and then I wired up outlets for the induction cooktop and the microwave oven, I then labeled everything so that I can know what it is in the future if I forget, or others if they need to use the system, and now it's all done. Now, as you can see, there are other components in here, like the solar charge controllers. I'll be getting into those in the next video as I go over the solar racking and the installation of the solar system. I hope this has been helpful for you to see how this works, and like I said, all of the links of all of these products and the tools that I used are in the description down below. And with that, I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. What do you want me to do? <laughs> you are so nice. <laughs> okay. I'll see you in the next video.